On this episode of 10-8, Sheriff Ken Mascara will join us and highlight his priorities for 2016. Detectives from our Economic Crimes Unit will be here to talk about those pesky phone scams that are plaguing our community. And members of our School Resource Unit will be here to announce the summer camps planned for 2016. It's an episode you won't want to miss. Stay tuned, we're about to go 10-8. Hello and welcome to this episode of 10-8, your inside look at the St. Lucie County Sheriff's Office. I'm your host, Brian Beatty, and to kick off today's show, we welcome Sheriff Ken Mascara. Sheriff, good to see you. Brian, thanks for having me. We've started off 2016, so let's recap some of the accomplishments of the agency from 2015. Well, first and foremost, uh, crime was again down in 2015, like it was in 2014. Uh, violent crime was also down. Um, and also, following the, the statistics from the Florida Sheriff's Association as well as the uh, League of Counties, uh, our Sheriff's Office is one of the most efficient and effective Sheriff's Offices in the state of Florida and something uh, we're very proud of. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Tell us about some of the uh, most notable stories from 2015. Well, in 2015, we were still dealing with uh, the effects of incidents that happened in 2013. And most of our viewers know we had, uh, for the first time in the history of the St. Lucie County Sheriff's Office, we had two deputies shot in the line of duty. Uh, the first one was our own Sergeant Gary Morales, who was uh, tragically killed on February 28, 2013. And then about uh, eight months later, uh, Detective Paul Pearson was shot in a search warrant uh, working with the Marshal Service in Highlands County. Uh, last year, uh, the shooter of Sergeant Gary Morales was found guilty uh, of first degree murder. The jury recommended death in that case, however, the judge has not sentenced uh, the shooter in that case and uh, we're waiting for that to resolve probably in the next couple of weeks, maybe a month. And in regard to Detective Paul Pearson's uh, shooters, uh, both of them were found guilty and they were sentenced to 27 years in prison. Uh, so as one chapter folds uh, on the Detective Paul Pearson shooting and that weight uh, is lifted off of us, uh, we are still waiting uh, for the uh, final chapter in the Sergeant Gary Morales case. And we're looking forward to closure in that. Um, we continue to be very active in our community, uh, supporting a tremendous amount of different uh, social groups uh, for the betterment of our community. I continue to uh, share with our community that when we, as, as a group, uh, myself and the, the heroes of the Sheriff's Office, invest our time and talents in our community, we all are better because of that. Absolutely. Tell us a little bit about Ricky. Oh boy, Ricky. Uh, there's uh, not a place that I don't go that someone doesn't mention Ricky. Uh, last year, uh, we had a 15-year-old boy, for lack of a better description, just vanish. Um, the boy was uh, under the guardianship of his grandmother, and uh, usually uh, he would go out in the afternoon and play basketball in a community uh, basketball uh, playground uh, in his community. And uh, this one Thursday afternoon, he did just that. And uh, when he was supposed to be home for dinner, uh, his grandmother went looking for him and uh, found his phone as well as some personal items at the basketball court, but no Ricky. And that uh, started a 48-hour uh, manhunt with all of our personnel in addition to uh, having Florida Department of Law Enforcement, other sheriff's offices and police agencies assist us and even the FBI assisted us. Uh, in the recovery of Ricky. And we were able to bring Ricky home exactly 48 hours after he disappeared. And that in itself is unique because in cases like this, uh, most of the time, either the child is never found or they're found deceased. So to bring Ricky home alive and well uh, was a great accomplishment for us. And an excellent testament to the collaboration between the agency and others as well as the heroes of the agency. That is correct. 
Tell us about some of the priorities for 2016 as we move into that year. Well, 2016, we want to continue to build on the great success we've had with our intelligence-led policing unit. Uh, a couple of years ago, we initiated that in the office, and uh, that unit is using crime stats and trends to actually predict crime in our community, and uh, we are able to prevent crime from it actually happening. Uh, the results of that is our lower crime trend over the last two years, uh, significant lower crime trends. Uh, so we're going to continue uh, using crime stats and information technology to combat crime rather than just guns and bullets alone. We also have our STAR team, which we implemented two years ago. It's a uh, specialized unit within the Sheriff's Office that follow these crime trends in a, an effort to uh, prevent them uh, from occurring. And the STAR team has been very active not only in the crime fighting aspect uh, of our community and what our agency does, but also the community interaction, uh, the positive community interaction. They've been active in uh, delivering uh, Thanksgiving meals, uh, Christmas toys, and just last week uh, delivered Easter dinners uh, to families uh, here in St. Lucie County. Uh, working with the community obviously has been a priority for a long time. Tell us about the Garden Terrace neighborhood and what's going on there. The Garden Terrace neighborhood is located uh, off of uh, Avenue uh, E uh, between uh, 30th Street and 33rd Street in Fort Pierce. It uh, was a neighborhood plagued by high crime, uh, high violence, uh, high drug activity. Uh, it's a housing authority property. And uh, for lack of a better word, the kids there that lived in that environment really had no future. Um, they, uh, they saw themselves embedded in this, uh, in this society uh, which really didn't offer them much uh, in the way of a future. And uh, what we did is, uh, a couple of years ago, we began uh, actively uh, being involved in that community through the first step, and that's an initiative with Scott Van Duzer, our local uh, Big Apple Pizza owner. And we adopted uh, a park there that uh, was neglected for many years, and uh, we cleaned up the park, and then we went door to door and invited children to come to that park and uh, play with uh, adults who were positive role models. And we wanted uh, that positive interaction with those children. And I'll tell you, the first couple weeks, we didn't have many kids show up. But as of last Tuesday, uh, we had about 150 kids mm -hmm. on a Tuesday <coughs> afternoon. Wow. Uh, they come with their parents. We have a, a tremendous amount of community leaders that come out uh, to uh, positively interact with those, uh, these children in the community. And as a sheriff's office, we have now adopted that community. And uh, that community, uh, we uh, serve Thanksgiving meals to, Christmas uh, gifts to, um, as well as Easter, uh, Easter gifts to. And then uh, the, uh, the Boys and Girls Club has a unit there called uh, the Williams Center. It's housed within the Williams Center. And uh, just this year, we have actually put a presence there with making that a substation uh, for the sheriff's office. We have one full-time employee there who is uh, in charge of outreach to that community. And uh, we've adopted that community and the results are mind-blowing what has resulted. Crime has uh, come down. Uh, violent crime is almost non-existent in that community right now. And uh, the most important part of this, this whole process is now when we go into the community, we in law enforcement, the kids welcome us, uh, the parents welcome us, and it's, uh, it's been such, such a positive interaction that has developed. That, that's a great testament as well to the, to the dedication of the agency. Correct. One of the priorities <coughs> that has come out over the last <coughs> six months or so has been a national campaign called See Something, Say Something. Uh, tell us a little bit about that and why it's important for folks in the community to say something when they see something that just doesn't seem right. Well, I'll take the Garden Terrace community for example. Uh, long instilled in that community was if violence breaks out, you just keep your mouth shut, uh, let it work its way through uh, the community uh, justice system, not the criminal justice system, and uh, leave the police out. Well, now uh, the message is, listen, for us to stop violence in your community, you do need law enforcement interaction, and we need you as a partner in this. So uh, we don't want you to be silent. If you see something, if you hear something, 
let us know and let us interact. And uh, just recently in Brussels, uh, this became very apparent when after the bombing, a taxi driver said, uh, he called up and he said, I saw something that I just felt wasn't right. And he actually led police to where uh, the apartment was where these uh, three bombers came from. So uh, the, the, uh, the initiative is really simple. If do something doesn't look right to you, something doesn't feel right to you, please call us. Let us look into it and handle it. That's great. And we also have just recently put uh, a uh, form on our, on our website where folks can anonymously leave tips. They will come to one of our crime analysts and be routed to the correct person for a response. And you know, that's one of the biggest uh, concerns that we hear in law enforcement. Well, if I call and give information, then you're gonna want my name, you're gonna want my address, and maybe somebody might retaliate against me. Well, now we have avenues where people can anonymously give us that information, either through our website, Crime Stoppers is a great uh, tool that they can use and actually get paid for it. Uh, so uh, these are avenues we want people to pursue to remain anonymous and share the information with law enforcement. Just wrapping up uh, our segment with you, Sheriff, you've talked a lot about being proactive in the community, specifically with members of the community and with children. What are some of the, the results that you're seeing from that that may be different from other areas of, of the state or even the country with their perceptions of law enforcement? Well, I believe uh, the country as a whole has uh, developed a mistrust against law enforcement. And I think that starts from uh, when children are small and uh, maybe they hear their parents or, uh, or adults talk uh, badly about law enforcement and their interaction with law enforcement. Well, at that young age, we want to start positive interactions with those children. And we want to continue those positive interactions as they grow older so that, God forbid, they do have a negative interaction with law enforcement. They realize we're just doing our job and that uh, we're human and that uh, we have to do what we're paid to do also. But they've had this long history of positive interactions with us. Uh, and that says a lot when they look at the entire picture. Very good. Well, Sheriff, thank you very much for coming and spending some time with us today. We appreciate it. Glad to be here. And stay tuned. There's more to come on 10-8 in just a moment. Welcome back to 10-8. I'm your host, Brian Beatty. And now to talk about some of the scams that are going on in our community, Detective Robert Lee from our Economic Crimes Unit is here with us. Welcome, Detective Lee. Thank you for having me, Ron. Can you start off by telling us a little bit about what an economic crimes detective does? Uh, pretty much economic crimes detective. Uh, within the St. Louis County Sheriff's Office, the economic crimes is attached to our criminal investigations division. Uh, currently, we have three detectives that are assigned to economic crimes, which we investigate uh, anything from scams to uh, money laundering to exploitation, uh, anything really that has to do with money, um, that economic crimes detective will investigate that. So we're specialized in investigating basically money type crimes. We've seen and heard a lot about scams going on all over the Treasure Coast. Um, tell us some of, some of the ones that you're getting calls about and that you're seeing uh, from, the, from the investigative side. All right, well, we, we get quite a few and they, they seem to come up with a new one every week. Right now, this time of year, you know, we're just coming through tax season. The IRS scam is a big one. Um, we probably getting four to five of those a week at least, um, where people are getting called by the supposed IRS, you know, and being threatened to go to jail or, or things such as that nature. Um, so that's probably one of the big, the common one that we're seeing right now, um, but they range from that to a Craigslist scams, to lottery scams, to uh, you want a grant scam, anything that they can think of that they think they can fool people into giving them money, they, they, will, they will try to scam people out of their money. Um, what should folks do if they receive a phone call or an email that may be one of these scams? Well, this is what I was talking back about the IRS. The IRS is never going to call you on the phone. They're either going to send you some kind of documentation or they're just going to freeze your bank account. <laughs> okay, they don't call you on the phone. So that's a first indicator that something's not right. If they're claiming they're from the Internal Revenue Service and they're calling you on the phone, a red flag should be going up going, hey, this, this, is, not, this is not correct. Um, another thing I always tell people, if you think there might be a chance that there's something legitimate to this, you can always hang up 
find a legitimate number, call back and reinvestigate yourself to see if it's for real or not. Um, but don't ever give out any information over the phone like that. Um, so the best thing to do is, is if it doesn't seem right, just hang up. I would always say if something doesn't seem right, hang up the phone. You can always go back and research that to find out if that was a legitimate phone call or not. And chances are the more you keep the person on the phone talking to you, the more likely you may be convinced to actually turn over some money to them. That, that brings a good point because a lot of these operations um, happen in what I call a boiler room um, where you have a group of individuals that are nothing but calling phone and I call it phishing because they're constantly making phone calls and even if they only get a few people they're still taking quite a bit of money so and they actually believe it or not they have responses listed on a wall just like a call center where if you say something they counter your your rejection with another comment and they just keep trying to work you and work you and work you um, until they either <laughs> land you and get your money or you hang up on them so um, it's a pretty elaborate um, operation and most of the time it's done overseas um, and with the spoofing of phone numbers and you, you know manipulate the phone number it may look like a phone number coming from the United States but in turn it's a number that's jumped to places like Nigeria Russia places like that you have no idea who you're talking to where can folks in the community go to find out if something that they've seen in an email or gotten a phone call for, where can they find out if, in fact, it is a scam? Well, there's a couple of, of different things. Um, you can always contact your local law enforcement agency and not necessarily make it a report. If you, know, if you haven't lost any money, um, you can always contact us to see if maybe that's something that we're dealing with or something that we've seen. I have no problem with people calling me and asking me a, a question like that, or you have the Federal Trade Commission um, who you know, assist with a lot of the scams and uh, protection of your identity. Um, so those are two viable options that you know, if you wanted to check out to see about a particular um, scam or that you believe is a scam, you can always contact either your local law enforcement agency or the Federal Trade Commission. Very good. And if, in fact, someone is convinced to turn over money or um, information about their identity to one of these scams, what should they do if they are a victim? Well, if they are a victim, um, they need to contact law enforcement because a, a report needs to be generated. And the only way that I would be able to investigate their case would be if you know, they called 911 and made a report that ultimately ends up coming to me so I could do some follow-up investigation. I will say that those investigations are very difficult because they stem overseas beyond our authorities. Um, so I think this case of ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Um, if we could kind of help people not fall for these scams, it's, it's a whole lot easier because getting their money back and, and actually finding the perpetrator is almost impossible. So let's clarify just so everyone's clear. If you've not turned over any money, do, do you need to be notified at the sheriff's office that a phone call has been received? Um, we d I, I err on the side of caution here because, yes, I'd like people to contact us, but I think at the end of the day it would be overwhelming mm -hmm. because the amount of... Um, of scams that are being, you know, played upon people nowadays that, um, but if they feel it's important to them to contact law enforcement, then by all means do so. But I would say not necessarily um, every time you get a phone scam, you know, contact law enforcement, unless you're a victim and you lost money. Because sure. even I get those scams on about a daily basis. Exactly. So. Well, we've talked a lot about uh, email and phone scams, but identity theft is also something that's plaguing our community and something that economic crimes looks into. Tell us about the event on May 14th um, that may help prevent identity theft for some okay. of our residents. Very good. Uh, yes, we're offering a uh, free shredder day um, at the Sheriff's Office on May the 14th um, between 8 and 1 o'clock. And for everybody, they can bring two boxes of, of papers that they would like to be shredded. Um, that way, see that a lot of the times people are getting our information through things that we don't realize that we throw away that have identifying markers on them. Um, so it's a good chance for if anybody has items that are sensitive material with information on them to bring down to the Sheriff's Office on May the 14th. Um, and we'll be more than happy to shred them um, and make them go away so that uh, you don't have those items either in the landfill or in a garbage can or somewhere that other people have access to that. Okay, so May 14th from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. at the Sheriff's Office on Midway Road. At 4700 West Midway. And All Points Mobile Shredding is a partner with us in this. They're going to be there with their shredder trucks so folks can bring their boxes of personal information, 
their tax returns, credit card statements, whatever it is that they wish to shred, and we'll have someone there to help them with that. That's correct. So there will be law enforcement presence there. <laughs> so it's a trusted event, so we'll make sure that those items get shredded properly and disposed of. Very good. Well, thank you, Detective Lee, for joining us, for giving us information about phone scams and identity theft. And again, if anyone has questions, they can call the Sheriff's Office at 462-7300 and ask to speak with you in economic crime. That's correct. Great. Well, we'll be right back with more from 10 -8. And welcome back to 10-8. One of the priorities that Sheriff Mascara spoke about earlier in the show is commitment to kids and kids in our community. And with us now is Deputy Shirley Lindstadt from our School Resource Deputy Unit. And she's here to talk about some of the summer camp activities that will be planned this summer for kids in our community. Welcome Deputy Lindstadt, it's nice to have you back. Thank you, nice to be back. Tell us a little bit about the role of a School Resource Deputy first. Well, I think our primary role is to kind of try to bridge that gap between the youth and law enforcement um, in addition to uh, supply support to our administrative staffs in the schools. Uh, it's unfortunate, but with our changing world, there's been more of a need for uh, more authority um, on campuses, sadly, but uh, we try to do that and make that transition and offer that support without coming off as a militant situation. So um, it's challenging, but uh, we've got some really good people in those roles and we're making some really good connections with the young people as well as with the school board. So building that positive image, both with the kids and with uh, parents as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Very good. Well, uh, there's some exciting camps planned this year and we were just talking before we came back on about um, how they've evolved over the years. So tell us a little bit about the three different types of camps that are going to be offered this summer. Well, one of the things that I like um, about some of the changes that we've made with the camps is we're starting to involve some athletics. And that's going to gear more towards the older kids because in the past our camps have been from like a, an 8 to 12 range in the ages. And you can only keep, you know, teenagers busy with arts and crafts and things like that uh, for a small period of time. So we have integrated some athletics. Uh, this year specifically we are integrating a soccer camp and then we are also doing a basketball camp. And we've been very fortunate with the community coming together and offering us venues and working with us so that we can try to make this affordable for people because that's another issue that we, you know, that the community contends with is, is the economy. So um, I'm very excited about those, uh, those new changes. So there's two sets of activity camps um, that run a week of each. And one is uh, in our northern part of the county at Westwood High School, and the Correct. other one held at the same time is at our southern end of the county at Northport K-8. Correct. And they're going to be repeated twice for two different age groups. And the information is going to be on the screen for our viewers to watch. Um, but tell us a little bit about what goes on at those activity camps. And, and those are our traditional camps, so anybody who's been in the past will be familiar. It's very much the same thing. Um, and basically we're just bringing the kids together in those two different age groups to socialize, to create relationships, to relate to them as human beings, which uh, especially in today's culture, uh, with all of the violence towards law enforcement today, seems to be absent. You know, the fact that there's a connection that we are humans as well. We bleed just like they bleed and we cry just like they cry when we're hurt. So uh, it's an important step toward renewing and refreshing that concept, I guess, if you will, that, uh, you know, that we're approachable, we're people just like them, and making those human connections, which mm -hmm. is important and challenging in today's technological world. Uh, but it's, it's very important, and that's basically what that camp is all about, us going and doing hands-on things with, with these kids that come out, whether it be arts and crafts, uh, whether we have some playtime outside, um, we have an educational period right after lunch, which is always challenging, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, and talking about you know, just social skills, things that, that they need to hear repetitively that hopefully they get in the home, and then they're also going to get in school, and then they're also going to get from, from us as a different uh, face within society. So um, it's all character building and it's meant to be fun and to facilitate relationships. And new this year is a soccer camp. Yes. 
So that's very gonna exciting. be a little bit of a different take. We've got a, a member of our school resource unit that's very familiar with soccer. We do, um, Deputy Lopez. I believe he coaches his son's team, but um, I think soccer is, a, is, is, is near to his heart. He enjoys the sport as well. And that was kind of his baby and he's taken that. And then we have uh, our basketball camp as well, which we have Deputy Archie who is going to be spearheading that. And that's a, a passion of his. And, and that's really what makes these successful true is that not just that the sheriff facilitates, you know, gives us the latitude to facilitate these, but that we have people who are truly passionate about these sports and about dealing and working with kids mm -hmm. that makes that whole recipe just a, a successful one. And you mentioned that affordability is a very important factor. Um, the activity camp and the soccer camp are both $20 per student. I believe so, yes. But the basketball camp is free. That's right. So a real good deal for, for families that are looking for something for their kids to do this summer. Absolutely. And again, that information is going to be on the screen. How can folks register and when can they start registering for this? Um, I believe they've already started taking registration, but if they go to the Sheriff's Office website, which is www.stlucysheriff.com, um, they can navigate to the either the public events or to the school resource uh, page, and they should be able to find a tab for the the camp registration forms. Um, they can also stop by our lobby anytime between 8 and 5, Monday through Friday, excluding holidays, and uh, they would be able to furnish them with, with camp registration forms there as well. Great. What are some of the other things that school resource deputies provide for our community? Um, well, obviously we're at the schools for not only law enforcement, but also for support uh, for the staff. But uh, we also do things like bike rodeos and we have fingerprinting events. And uh, those are basically just uh, public relations events where the schools are either doing something, a festival or something, and we can augment that. They invite us in to augment that. Um, we highly recommend that the parents take advantage, especially of the younger children, of the fingerprinting that we do because it, it gives them a nice little quaint printout of not only their children's fingerprints, but a current photo and vital information that should, God forbid, anything happen and they come up missing, that's something quick that they can provide to law enforcement that would be very a very useful tool for us. Um, but th those are all, again, part of that mentality that the sheriff alluded to earlier of reaching out and making those human connections with our community because it's, it's so important, especially in today's technological world where so much is done remotely, mm -hmm. that we still have that face-to-face -face contact, that they still connect with us as human beings and not just as images or, or, or symbols of, of a certain thing. And uh, uh, I, I can't say enough about it. It's a very exciting unit to be a part of and I enjoy it thoroughly. As we wrap up, give us one or two takeaways that would be important for families, specifically parents, to know about working with their kids. Well, I think the most important thing as a parent myself, but also from the perspective of a law enforcement officer that I'm seeing is true substantial engagement with your children. Taking that time to put everything else that's stressing you in your life aside and sit down and speak with your child like a child, you know. So, so, so many times when something happens, our children, you know, annoy us or things like that, that's what a child is going to do. And if we don't take the time to be a loving parent and to set all those other things aside and legitimately engage with our kids as a parent and not as an overworked mom or an overworked dad, um, then so much gets lost in the cracks, so much slips through the cracks. And, you know, these kids are, are young, they're impressionable, they learn very quickly from our behavior. So take that time and, and, and spend it with your kids and have that goofy conversation and that goofy talk and, uh, and, and let that evolve as your kids get older. Mm -hmm. You know, it can't stop once they reach a certain age. Teens the teenage years are an important year and it's it's twice as challenging for parents because that's also the year that they're the years that they're pushing you away but you have to apply yourself and try to find a way to stay connected with them on you know a positive level because that's where we end up losing a good majority of them to other influences and and it's challenging but it can be done there are lots of success stories out there sure well, very good. Thank you, Deputy Lindstadt, for coming and sharing with us some of these exciting uh, opportunities for our community. And we'll be right back with more on 10 -8.
Thank you for joining us for another episode of 10-8. If you have questions or want more information about anything that you've heard on today's show, feel free to call our office at 772-462-7300 or go to our website at stlucysheriff.com. You can also follow us on Facebook or Twitter at stlucysheriff. Thank you again, and on behalf of Sheriff Ken Mascara, stay safe, and we'll see you next time.